So let's open our Bibles tonight to Timothy chapter 4. This is the last chapter for us to finish up completely the New Testament. And kind of befitting, this is the last epistle that Paul wrote. And we've kind of focused on the fact that this is Paul's last will and testament. That this is his letter, and he's going to reveal in this letter that he absolutely knows he is about to be poured out or be put to death as he's writing this letter. It gives us a little bit different perspective on this letter written to Timothy. You think of many times a dying man's last words or normally very much in truth. So as we are jump in tonight to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, we are going to start off tonight's class very academic. We're going to be very doctrinal. And what we are going to study before we jump in tonight is a doctrinal summary of the judgments. The judgments we find in Scripture. Our first judgment we come to is the judgment of Adam and Eve. And this is in Genesis 3, 14 through 24. This is where God banishes the very first couple from the garden for violating his command to not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this judgment brought judgment effects upon all of creation. Then we have the judgment of the antediluvian world, or the world before Noah's flood. And this is where God brings the worldwide flood and judgment upon all mankind because of all of the sin during Noah's time. Then there was the judgment of the Tower of Babel. And this is Noah's post-flood descendants remaining in one location as God declared and told them to leave and go and replenish the earth. And God confused the languages, causing them to disperse over the earth. And I'll kind of put a little thing in here. This is also where we have the establishment of human government. And we have the Tower of Babel. And in this Tower of Babel, we have what's set up as the world's system. That's mentioned in Genesis and also mentioned throughout all the way through Revelation. That this world system, that the political world system is the, in the essence of Babylon. We have the judgment of Egypt and their gods. This is the ten plagues. And these were mighty acts of judgment. And this was against a stubborn, cruel king and an idolatrous people and their God. And then we have the judgment of sin. The judgment of sin. Specifically, the believer's sin. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Jesus took this judgment upon himself by his crucifixion and death. He suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Hebrews 2, 9 also continues with this. Because of our sin, was judged at the cross, there is now no condemnation for those who were in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1. It is also at the cross that God pronounced judgment on the unbelieving world and on the enemy of our soul, Satan. As Jesus said shortly before his arrest, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. This is one of the reasons that we believe that truly this tree of the knowledge of good and evil 
has a good side and a bad side. And many times, one of the greatest hindrances to believing in Christ is human goodness. One of the greatest sins, and you could even put this as one of the greatest sins, because it leads to the sin of unbelief, which is the greatest sin, is the belief that I somehow can merit God's favor. Then we come to the judgments that occur during the church age. And there are two judgments that happen during the church age. There is self-evaluation. This is in 1 Corinthians 11:28, where believers are to practice self-examination prayerfully and honestly assessing their own spiritual condition. The church helps in this endeavors, endeavor to purify the body of Christ. And in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And then also self-judgment requires each believer to be spiritually discerning with a goal of being more like Christ. Ephesians 4, 21 through 23. In this spiritual discerning, we also go back to the fact that our emotions are not our spirit. Our emotions are in the soul. And I usually think of the emotions as a bridge between the somatic or the body and the soul. Then we have divine discipline. This is a judgment also during our church age. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11 is our scripture. And it talks about, as the father lovingly corrects his children, so the Lord disciplines his own. That is, he brings his followers to a place of repentance and restoration when they sin. In doing so, he makes a distinction between us and the world. When we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. 1 Corinthians 11.32. And it also says, Whom Christ loves, he chastens. And our other scripture reference is Revelation 3.19 for divine discipline. And then there's some judgments that have not happened yet. Future judgments to come. There will be the judgment of the tribulation, Revelation 6 through 16. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, seven bowls poured out. God's judgment against the wicked will leave no doubts as to his wrath against sin. Besides punishing sin, these judgments will have an effect of bringing the nation of Israel to repentance. We truly do believe that all God's promises will be fulfilled and that God still has a plan for the nation of Israel. Another future judgment coming is the judgment seat of Christ, which we also call the Bema seat judgment. This is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Resurrected, resurrected and raptured believers will in heaven will be judged for their works. Sin is not the view at this judgment as that was paid for by Christ, but only faithful only faithfulness in Christian service. Selfish works or those done with wrong motives will be burned up as wood, hay, and stubble. In works of lasting value, the Lord, uh, value to the Lord will survive. The gold, the silver, the precious stones. Rewards which the Bible calls crowns, Revelation 3.11, will be given by the one who is not unjust. He will not forget your works and the love you have shown him. Hebrews 6, 10. There's also a coming judgment of the nations. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. After the tribulation, the Lord will sit in judgment over the Gentile nations. They will be judged according to their treatment of Israel during the tribulation. This judgment is also called the judgment of the sheep and the goats because of the imagery Jesus used on the Olivet Discourse. Those who showed faith in God by treating Israel favorably, giving them aid and comfort during the tribulation are the sheep 
who will enter in the millennial kingdom. Those who followed the Antichrist and let Antichrist's lead and persecuted Israel are the goats who will be consigned to hell. There will also be a judgment of angels. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 through 3. Paul says that Christians will judge angels. Anybody have any idea when this will happen? Neither do I. We don't really know exactly the ramifications about this, other than we know that we are told that we will judge angels. Don't know. More than likely, I think it's going to happen after that. We aren't exactly, go ahead. In, in the millennial reign, isn't Jesus going to come and set up his kingdom with his bride? Yes. In the millennial reign, right? Remember, the devil walked away. For a thousand years. A thousand years for a different time. So are the, the, uh, the, the, the angels going to be walking around the same time? Or are the angels going to be walking around the same time? Yes. Yes. So we aren't exactly sure what is meant, but the angels facing judgment would have to be fallen angels. It seems that Satan's horde of demons will be judged by the redeemed ones of the Lamb. Some of these demons are already imprisoned in darkness, awaiting judgment, according to Jude 1, verse 6, due to their leaving their proper dwelling places. Pastor Bob pulled out. And then there is finally the great white throne judgment. This is the final judgment of unbelievers for their sins. It occurs after the millennial and before the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. At this judgment, unbelievers from all ages are judged for their sin and are consigned to a lake of fire. I said at this judgment, unbelievers from all the ages are judged for their sin and consigned to the lake of fire. Yes. This is all after the rapture. So the, the great white, white throne judgment is the final judgment. This is where, as um, it says, the second death occurs. Only for unbelievers. And when does that happen? At the end of the millennial reign. Before the new heaven and the new earth? Correct. So let's open and let's start tonight in 2 Timothy 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by the appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, rebu rebuke, sorry, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So Paul's giving a charge here. He's setting Timothy on a mission. And I think honestly this is for really written towards pastors, but everyone has their call in which they need to take this charge. So he's giving marching orders. As Paul is pretty much turning over 
at least a portion of his ministry to Timothy, that in Ephesus. So he's setting this direction for Timothy and pastors to follow. And it's a pretty simple message. Preach the word. Preach the word. There is only one thing as pastors that we have, that we have to say, and there's no other message. I can't remember who did this homiletics class, but I've take, taken a homiletics class. And the pastor said that was leading this, there is biblical expository preaching, and then there's not preaching. That if we are not preaching the word, if what we are doing is not pulling out from the word, anything that we're giving to the congregation is meaningless. It is only preaching the word. It's all that we have as a message for the body. So preach the word. Paul also mentions and why I went into the judgments today that there will be the dead and living judged. And then there will also be a judgment at his appearing, which is what we believe is the rapture, and also another one at his kingdom. Then he goes on and he says, preaching in season and out of season. This is definitely a poetic phrase that Paul is using. And you have the picture of here of preaching during the good times in life and then preaching also during the storms of life. When there is convenience and there is also struggles. But truly, this preach the word means to always preach it. Whether it's convenient or whether it's not, whether it's good, whether it's bad, preaching the word at all times. And our preaching of the word should do three things. It should reprove, which is to refine, to rebuke or make correction, and to exhort or give encouragement. But as pastors, as we do this reproving and rebuking and exhorting, it has to truly come from a heart of patience. Because teaching, learning, the development of the believer, bringing to maturity takes time. If you've raised children, and Dana and I have raised three, it takes a long time when that child is born to raise them up takes a very, very long time. And as pastors, we a lot of times might feel the need to reprove and rebuke it. And then when they don't take our advice or our correction, sometimes we might be a little upset. But it takes patience. And this is the preparation of the pastor as we're given it. As we are reproving, as we are rebuking, as we are exhorting people, it always has to be done with patience. Many times we should not really expect it to happen very quickly any more than I expected my children to walk very quickly, to talk. We taught all three of our children to read and that took a lot of time. It takes time. But I can say one thing that I remember when Tyler first was able to read because we homeschooled Tyler. It was kind of the most amazing feeling when he would pick up a book and would read. I do not want green eggs and ham. I do not want green <laughs> them Sam I am. But it was just an amazing experience that he got words off the page. And I don't think green eggs and ham was his first book, but Dana might be able to refresh my memory of what his first book was. But it was an amazing thing, and we should see that as pastors. When we're investing into our congregation, and they finally come up to and say, I do not want green eggs and ham. I do not want them, Sam, I am. It should bring that same kind of feeling to us, that we've invested something into them, that we've exhorted, that we've reproved, that we've corrected. And all of a sudden now, we are seeing a little glimmer of maturity happening in their lives. 
As we preach the word, we really see the great commission that Jesus gave to us is two-phased. There are two messages that we preach out of the word. We preach the message of eternal life, and we also preach the message of abundant life. What Pastor Bob talked about, sanctification. We see those as abundant life principles for the believers. Verse three, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. I don't think that Paul is really just talking about biblical teaching. In the time of Timothy and Paul, there were a lot of great Greek and Roman thinkers. People that would reason and debate and math grew a lot during this time and the scientific method was just at its infant state and people were embracing actually reasoning through things. And I don't really think that Paul's talking about the myths of the Roman deities and the Greek deities here. We like to think that the Romans and the Greeks thought these were just stories like we have of Superman and Wonder Woman and Batman. But you read some of the Greek literature, like uh, uh, Socrates was, was uh, condemned to death because he pervert, was leading the children away from the Greco gods. And I don't think those were really myths that they wrote about back then. It was truly their heartfelt religion, for lack of better words. I really believe that the myths that Paul is talking about here is fantasy. It is fantasy. And I really believe that in the last days, people will come to a point, and I think that we're even seeing a lot of this today. They don't even care to reason through things, but they would much rather live in a metaverse or an Animal Crossing or in any kind of these fantasy worlds. And they will just completely depart from even any kind of thinking or reasoning most of all the word of God, but even in what we might call secular sciences, they will even reject those for a life of fantasy. Because sound reasoning, teaching, it's hard. It takes a lot of work to understand. And living in a world of fantasy is so easy. Verse five. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We are made aware of what the world will become, a world of fantasy, lacking reason, a world of what I feel, what my feelings are will have more control than what actually is. We are aware that this is what's going to happen in the world. We even see a lot of it happening today. But as believers, as Paul says, but as for you, we use reason. We accept the struggle. We do our work and we fulfill our mission. This is what he says. Be sober-minded, enduring suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Regardless of how fantasy land the world looks around us, we are aware, but as for you, as for you, carry on. Use your reason, accept the struggle, do your work, and fulfill your mission. These are our tactics to live by. We use reason, we accept struggle, we do our work, we fulfill our mission. No matter how crazy public opinion becomes, we continue on in these. We use our reason, 
accept the struggle, we do our work, and we fulfill the mission that God has put us on. Verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I find it quite intriguing that here Paul has been stoned, he's been shipwrecked, he's been bitten by snakes, and he's had all this confidence throughout his whole ministry. Yet he knows this time in prison, because he'd already been in prison before, this time is the final round. And when you look at the life of Peter, Peter also wrote, knowing that his time had come. They had both escaped death multiple times. And I can really only truly attribute, attribute their knowledge to knowing this is their time by being attuned to the Spirit. Knowing spiritually that this is the time. Also, Paul also speaks again of the appearing of Christ. The appearing is the rapture. And then it's followed by the judgment of believers. A judgment not of eternal life, but what I would call a judgment of our abundant life. We call it the Bema Seat Judgment. 1 Corinthians 3.11 No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives he will receive a reward if anyone's work is burned up he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved but only as through fire. We've talked many times, and I think it was Pastor Love that had brought out about the wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones. That the wood is the things in our lives that have taken a long time. Might be my career. If I went out to to grow wood, I would plant an acorn in the ground. It would take a lifetime to see that tree sprout and become a tree. Those long-term things in our lives are our wood. My career. The hay. Hay is a seasonal thing. Bill goes down and cuts hay on the farm twice a year. It's those seasonal things in life, those things that come and they go. Maybe there are relationships. Maybe anything that is seasonal in our life. Yes. Cats are seasonal things. It's a seasonal thing, it truly is. And then stubble, the sin and the struggles of our lives the junk all those at the bema seat judgment will be burnt up no matter how great of a computer tech i've been um, which is my current career no matter how great of a, of a manager and salesperson i was before it burns up my friendships that were only for a seasonal time those will burn up the sins that I have in my life, those will all be burned up. We'll be happy to see the stubble burn, won't we? 
Sometimes it's a little uneasy, though, thinking that this career that I've built my whole life might go. And then we have the gold, silver, and precious stones. Pastor Love called gold is our one-on-one -on -one relationship with our Heavenly Father. Or the silver being our reflection of Jesus Christ. And the precious stones, those that we have led to Christ. And for those three things that we have that remain, the gold, the silver, the precious stones, we receive crowns. These are rewards. This is how scripture defines our rewards. We have the imperishable crown. Let's put on our academic hat again. The imperishable crown, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, for everyone who completes, competes for the prize is temperate or disciplined in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. There's a crown of rejoicing, 1 uh, Thessalonians 2.19, the crown of rejoicing. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? The crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4.8. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The crown of glory, 1 Peter 5.4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Then the crown of life, Revelation 2.10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw out some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. Verse 9. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Demalta. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's very useful for me, useful to me for ministry. Tychicus, and I know I'm butchering these names, but bear with me. I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Capris at Troas, also the books and all above the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be aware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. There's a lot of things that we can unpack from here. And we've already done so much of doctrinal stuff, I'm not going to put you through other doctrinal summaries, but I would encourage you to take some time and study a few of these doctrines that we would get from this small portion. One is exemplified by Demas, how the love of this world affects the believer. Study the restoration of Mark and how he has been made useful to the ministry, even penning one of the Gospels. The repayment to those that actively stand in the way of the Gospel. 
as exemplified by Alexander. You know, we, we run across different types of unbelievers. There are those that just do not know. There are some that do not care. But there are also those that actively stand in opposition to Christ. They know him as the demons do, with no love for him. There's also the doctrine that grace is given to believers that fail when times get tough. As Paul said, I pray the Lord does not hold this against them that deserted him. And then we have the assurance that even if everybody deserts us, God stands with us. And this verse 18, I think, should be imprinted in your brain. You should remind yourself over and over again, especially when you face hard times, that the Lord will rescue me from evil deeds and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Verse 19, greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Oneferus. Erastus remained at Corinth and I left Trumphimus, Trumphimus who was ill at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter Ebelus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with you, your spirit, and grace be with you. I find it interesting, because especially in this gospel, Paul is mentioned, and I think we could really pull out the preaching, teaching ministry of women from this book. Because he mentions Priscilla and Aquila and Lois and um, Eunice. And all four of these women were teachers. Priscilla and Aquila, they shared the gospel to Apollos, who was familiar with John the Baptist but it was not aware that Jesus Christ came. And then you have the very special ministry, and as we have mothers and grandmothers here that have invested into their children and grandchildren, that that is an incredibly special ministry, that they raised up Timothy to lead the largest church. I believe Ephesus was the largest church in Asia Minor at that time. It was through their teaching of young Timothy from a young age to empower him. The first women evangelists were the women running from the empty tomb to tell the disciples that Jesus was raised from the dead. Would be an awesome study Now this is the final word from Paul, his last letter. You could see it as a last will and testament. And in this last will and testament, Paul leaves Timothy with absolutely nothing of physical value. He leaves him only with things of eternal value. As he said in chapter one, grace, mercy, peace, faith, power, love and self-control. That's what he leaves them. And a few warnings. Fear not. Fear not. Be not ashamed. And also expect suffering in this life. We continue on and we preach two messages. Eternal life to unbelievers that they may have eternal life. And then we preach of an abundant life for the believers. A message of sanctification. As believers, we are not judged for sin. Sin was judged upon Jesus Christ. 
he was judged for our sins. The judgment for eternal life has already happened. But as believers, we also will be judged for our abundant life. As we live in abundant life principles, we gain the rewards, the crowns. We also gain rewards in this life. Because the abundant life is more than just rewards at the end of this life. It is all these things, the grace, the mercy, the peace, the faith, the self-control, the love that we live in this life. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Apply these things to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.